When I picked this subject uh, for the conference, uh, some people may have wondered what the relevancy is to us with our ex-Mormonism and to family members who are still Mormons. And I'm pretty sure by the time I'm finished, you'll understand what the connection is because I am going to weave through this some uh, situations that do involve Mormons that uh, I think some of us are aware of and some of us are not. Um, I'm going to be reading most of the talk because most of what's in here is the research that I found and um, some of it I've put in my own words but most of it is, is out of it. Uh, by the time I was done researching this talk uh, I had a stack of papers at least that high and um, thank goodness for the internet. But I whittled it down and I edited and edited it in order to get it uh, into the time frame. I'm going to need light up here. Yeah, that's good. Um, I've had an interest in constitutional issues ever since I was in high school. For some reason, the issue of church versus state has always zinged me a little bit, and I've always kind of paid attention to it. Uh, when it really uh, kind of really clicked into a really deep interest was about four years ago when I started seeing interviews of an author by the name of Jeff Charlotte who wrote a book called The Family. We had Jeff here uh, three years ago to speak to us and uh, to talk about the research that he had done about a particular Christian group that had had an enormous influence in our government for many, many years, which most people are not aware of. And so I started getting really interested and I started doing a lot of reading. I want to make sure that you know that what I'm talking about today is not freedom, uh, not freedom f uh, from religion, but freedom of religion separate from our government and from the state. Um, I'm talking about a percentage of our Christian population that is very, very specific. And I want to make sure, because I know that there are people in our audience who uh, are Christians and are believers, and I want to be very respectful of that. I want to make sure that you know that I am not uh, painting a broad brush on Christianity with what I am uh, revealing to you today. It is about a certain uh, s relatively small but growing group that has had a great influence among some of our institutions in the government. Now before I start uh, getting into that in specifics, um, there are th basically three different groups uh, in the Christian world that kind of intermingle with each other, but I, I, I need to give you a few definitions so you'll understand what some of the differences are. And the first one is a group called the fundamentalists, Christians who believe that they are fundamentalists. They believe that everything that is in the Bible is literal and that whatever interpretation their particular leader or pastor has taken is usually taken as being literal of, in the Bible. Uh, in its own way, uh, I think with our own, with the Mormonism scriptures, that Mormonism uh, is a fundamentalist religion because it takes the scriptures pretty literally. Uh, it doesn't push it like that as much as uh, other fundamentalist groups, but I believe that they, there's a lot of fundamentalist uh, thinking in Mormonism. The next ones are a uh, group called the Evangelists, and the way that they're uh, different from the fundamentalists is that they believe that it is incumbent upon them and that they have to go out and proselyte and evangelize, uh, evangelize to other people. And uh, they, they too uh, are fundamentalists in many ways as far as how they view scripture. But in the fundamentalist group, to some extent, they are not required to go out and evangelize. Jehovah Witnesses are you know, probably the group that we're most aware of that are, are required to spend so many hours a year in actually doing door-to-door -door and in doing uh, evangelizing to people. Now the third one is the group that we're going to be most in <clears throat> talking about today and they are called Dominionists. And a Dominionist takes things a bit further. Their goal is to create a form of Christian nationaliz nationalism in the United States. They believe the United States once was and should be again a Christian nation. Dominionists promote their religious supremacy, 
insofar as they generally do not respect the equality of other religions or even other versions of Christianity. Dominionists endorse theocratic goals, believing that the Ten Commandments or biblical law should be the foundation of American law and that the U.S. Constitution should be seen as a vehicle for implementing biblical principles. And they share the belief that Christians have a mandate to take dominion over every area of life. And it is just this tendency that has spread through the evangelical Protestant groups, resulting in the emergence of various brands of dominionist thinkers in the Christian world today. They believe civil government exists to implement God's laws. As more Christians adopt dominion theology, they will eventually convert the majority of Americans. Then the country will realize that the U.S. Constitution and the Bill of Rights are merely codicils to Old Testament biblical law. The distinguishing mark of a dominionist is a commitment to building a society that is exclusively Christian and although they represent different theological and political ideas, dominionists assert a Christian duty to take control of a sinful, secular society. There are several combinations of those above three groups that I've just talked about. <clears throat> Excuse me. I think Mormonism combines elements of all three, especially in the increasing dogmatism over doctrine and defining what is acceptable behavior for members of the church. In regards to what I'm discussing today, I would place Mormonism smack dab in the middle of the dominionist camp with certain evangelical characteristics. Most Christians would roll their eyes at this since they don't believe Mormons are Christian. I'm going to tell you about a series of situations and events that I've, that I've read about and come upon um, within the confines of our military institutions and in the government, I think some of these things will, will very surprise you very much, shock you, and probably anger you. My role today is to give you information about some abuses of the church and state separation and help you understand why the telling of these innocents is so important to all of us. Most Americans have no idea that these events have taken place. Out of an organizational necessity, I have grouped these things more into areas of, of similarity rather than by the date. So I will be jumping around uh, for uh, different things I'm going to tell you, but it all takes place within about the last 15 years. As I, re as I read and started studying, I was st uh, starting to see a definite pattern of egregious behavior of evangelists and dominionists in the United States military at a level that was shocking. Many of the guilty parties are military officers at the highest levels within our military academies and our military establishments. The same kind of incidents have been documented about our active duty troops deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan as well. A high percentage of the examples I give today revolve around our armed forces because it's where I think the biggest potential is for real damage that could impact us all. I'll also be telling you of some of the Mormon-related events that thread their way through this chronology. I'm going to start with a story about a father and his son in the Air Force Academy. One longtime Air Force Academy graduate has told the following story. He says, 42 years ago at the age of 18, I took the oath of office on my first day as an Air Force Academy cadet. The mission of the Academy was not only to train future leaders of the Air Force, but for America as well. The honor code became an integral part of everyday life. These are the values that I and most graduates of the 1960s and early 70s took with us from our four years at the academy. I underwent pilot training followed by tours of duty in Vietnam. 
Like military men and women of today, we did our best to become technically competent and be professional leaders. Never during my four years at the academy and subsequent pilot and combat training was the word warrior used. Nor, either as a cadet or officer, did I ever encounter Christian supremacist theories. In April of 2004, my son, after receiving a coveted appointment to the United States Air Force Academy, asked me to accompany him to the orientation for the new appointees. This 24-hour visceral event changed my life forever and crushed my son's lifelong dream of following in my footsteps. The orientation began with a one-hour warrior rant to appointees and parents by the com com commandant of the ca cadets. His name is Brigadier General Johnny Weida. The fact that the word warrior had replaced leadership was a signal of what was to follow. My son and I then made our way to the modernist aluminum chapel, which is here. Uh, he said they made their way to the chapel where he expected to hear a welcome from one or two Air Force chaplains offering counsel support and an open door policy for any spiritual or pastoral needs of these future cadets. In 1966, the academy had six gray-haired chaplains, three mainline Protestants, two priests, and one rabbi. Any cadet, regardless of his religious affiliation, was welcome to see any one of these chaplains. Instead, my son's orientation became an opportunity for the academy to aggressively proselyte this group of cadets. Major Warren Waddies led a group of 10 young, exclusively evangelical chaplains who stood shoulder to shoulder. He proudly stated that half of the cadets attended Bible studies on Monday nights in the dormitories, and he hoped to increase this number from those in his audience who were about to join their ranks. This invitation was followed with hallelujahs and amens by the evangelical clergy. No priest, rabbi, or mainline Protestant had been permitted to participate. There was more leading to his sons eventually resigning from the appointment that he was given. He did not stay at the academy. The Antunes experience was not an aberration. The hotbed of church versus state offenses has been at the academy in Colorado Springs, particularly the hotbed of evangelical activism. Stories have been drifting in and out of the academy for over a decade, with the offenses getting more serious as the years have gone by. Here are just a few examples. In 2004, cadets distributed leaflets at dinner at all the place settings for a screening of the movie The Passion of Christ. Around the same time, football coach Fisher DeBerry displayed a sign in the team locker room proclaiming I am a Christian first and last. I am a member of Team Jesus Christ. He had this over the door of the locker room, so they saw it every day. DeBerry has said he actually prayed to a master coach. Additionally, some other faculty members and coaches considered it their duty to profess their faith and discuss this issue in their classrooms to help develop cadet spirituality. As a cadet in 2004, Patrick Kuchera, an atheist, tried filing a complaint about the Christian proselyting with the Academy's uh, Military Equal Opportunity Office. The MEO officer, says Kuchera, not only discouraged the filing on technical grounds, but also said he felt obliged as a believer to, quote, try to bring you back to the flock. I know, some of these things are very surprising. In June of 2005, a study by the U.S. Air Force Academy described many other incidents of religious intolerance, insensitivity, and inappropriate proselyting. In spite of this report and others like it, the offenses continued, and I'm just getting started. 
Hundreds of incidents have been compiled by Mickey Weinstein, a Jewish graduate of the academy who was so shocked uh, in the previous year when his son Curtis, a cadet at the academy, told him he would beat the blank out of the next person who tells me our people are responsible for the execution of Jesus Christ. It was going on constantly to the Jewish cadets. An honor graduate of the Air Force class of 1977, Mickey Weinstein spent 10 years as an Air Force JAG, which means attorney, was a Reagan administration lawyer in the West Wing, was the former first general counsel for Ross Perot, and his son was the sixth generation of their family to graduate from the academy with a combined total of 130 years of active duty military service from World War I to today's War on Terror. Weinstein began documenting alleged religious slurs and church state violations at the academy from several sources, and he alerted national civil liberties groups. Then he formed the Military Religious Freedom Foundation in 2006. We'll learn more about their activities as we go along here. In December of 2006, a Christian group shot a video inside the Pentagon that featured uniformed senior military officers talking about their evangelical faith. After learning about this, Weinstein went on the attack. He held a press conference in Washington, D.C. to announce that he was asking the Department of Defense's Inspector General to look into the video and determine whether the people who appeared in it, Air Force Major General Jack Catton, Jr., Army Brigadier General Vince Brooks, the former Public Affairs Director of the Army, and Under Secretary of the Army Pete Jaron had violated military regulations. He also filed the Freedom of Information Act to find out who had approved the shooting of the video. Uh, another uh, executive director within the military and in the Pentagon uh, of the pe people who made the video told a reporter that he believes no regulations were violated. And he says Weinstein's allegations about increased evangelical influence within the military are wrong. From Weinstein, quote, I have talked to senior members of the military at the flag level rank, admiral and generals that have looked at me and said, come on, Mickey, your problem, we have the cure to cancer. If you had the cure to cancer, wouldn't you want to spread the word? They don't realize that when they say it, that to a person who isn't an evangelical Christian, you're calling their faith a cancer. This to me is as much of a security threat to the country as Al Qaeda." End of quote. Why has the Air Force Academy seemed to be at the very center of this war between church and state? The Academy is located in Colorado Springs and is surrounded by right-wing evangelical groups several of which maintain very close relationships with the Academy's faculty, staff, and cadets. These groups and the military officials who follow them have been integrating evangelical Christian Christianity into official Academy activities for 20 years. Over this time, they have promoted evangelical beliefs to cadets, used the religion as a tool for military training, and more about that later, and encourage religious conformity on campus. Okay, in addition to being headquarters for the Air Force Space Command, Northern Command, NORAD, numerous Air Force bases, and the Air Force Academy, Colorado Springs is also home to the nation's largest, most influential, and politically active evangelical organizations. James Dobson's Focus on the Family, which is so large that it maintains its own zip code, claims more than 200 million followers worldwide and is located directly across the highway from the Academy. When the Focus on the Family family's headquarters opened in 1993, the Academy's, the Air Force Academy's parachute team, the Wings of Blue, participated in the opening ceremony by delivering 
the keys of heaven to James Dobson's new facility, directly from the sky. Tom Minery, Vice President of Government and Public Policy for Focus on the Family, said the school's cadet chapel is not there by accident. These cadets are being trained to meet the ultimate sacrifice for their country and to meet their maker, he said. A private missionary group assigned a pair of full-time ministers to the academy where they were given a classroom to meet with the cadets at any time during the day. The only group that gets 24-7 unrestricted access to cadets is this fundamentalist born-again Christian group that assigned these two ministers to the academy. An Air Force chaplain who complained that evangelical Christians were trying to subvert the system was removed from her chaplaincy at the academy, essentially firing her from that position and basically ruined her career as a result because she complained. The missionary couple are not even chaplains. They are private, full-time ministers, and the group they belong to has had a presence at the academy for over a decade. Surveys of present and former cadets have shown that some students said they felt a very heavy and offensive emphasis from the evangelicals and that those who became born again began to testify and then aimed insults at the Jews, the Roman Catholics, and the Christians who were not evangelical. One staff chaplain told newly arrived freshmen that anyone not born again will burn in the fires of hell. This is not Christian versus Jew, Weinstein says. This is evangelical Christianity against everyone else. After years of complaints, the Academy asked the Yale Divinity School to visit the campus during the summer as the training began for the incoming freshmen. And when they were done with examining, attending meetings, and so forth and so on, they said that there was a very strange um, type of Christian voice dominating, and they didn't feel it made any sense in a place like the Air Force Academy. Not anything was done about their report. It was taken in and filed away. Department of Defense internal regulations make it very clear that members of the military cannot endorse any one particular political position or religious view. One military officer said to Weinstein, I share my faith, that's who I am, and let me tell you right now, the hierarchy as an old-fashioned American is that your first duty is to the Lord, second to your family, and third to your country. That is the exact opposite of what the military has always taught. And for anyone who understands anything about the military, while you are in the service, it is country first. Other officers have told Mikey that the officers who believe and behave this way need to be court-martialed. It would take years to court-martial all of the officers who have been complicit in this behavior. All complaints for years have seemed to fall on deaf ears. Evangelical groups have explicitly targeted the U.S. military, not just the Air Force Academy, in order to establish a base from which they can convert the U.S. government and the rest of the world. For example, a group called the Officers Christian Fellowship with 15,000 members and active in 80% of all military bases has a vision of a, quote, spiritually transformed milita military with the ambassadors for Christ in uniform. This is kind of the visual. <laughs> it's a church on top of a tank. No. <laughs> The aim of another group, Military Ministry, which is part of the Campus Crusade for Christ, located, are, is located at all military academies and basic training centers. And their goal is to, quote, evangelize and disciple all enlisted members of the U.S. military so as to transform our culture through the U.S. military. 
and to build Christian military leaders and influence our nation for Christ. Their ultimate vision is transforming the nations of the world through the militaries of the world. And they mean this absolutely. I read this over and over and over again. Here are some excerpts from a letter that Mikey received three years after he began representing military people who had been mistreated in this climate. It says, I am a blank officer in the United States Air Force, graduate of the United States Air Force Academy and, a, and son of an Air Force officer. I was raised in a Catholic household and I consider myself to be somewhat non-practicing and I certainly do not let my religious beliefs ever come into play in the workplace. Any good officer knows that trying to inject religious teachings into our diverse military is detrimental to morale and good order and discipline. Demanding responsibility and an adherence to the Air Force core values is more than enough. Yet I'm astonished to see that many in our profession do not feel the same way. Let me assure you that a fundamentalist Christian influence is ever present in our Air Force. Whenever I bear witness to these instances, it's always disappointing and sometimes downright uncomfortable. In fact, it can often be terrifying. And I'm assuming he was talking about demotion or punishment because there are several incidents where people have been demoted or basically harassed out of the, the military because of this. He goes on to describe many incidents and then says this, when you add everything up and weave it into the fabric of everyday life, what you have is an atmosphere where Christians are made to feel very welcome and every non-Christian and particularly mainline non-evangelical fundamentalist Christians, the ones who don't evangelize, are made to feel just as uncomfortable as the Jews and the atheists. He, and he said they are told to just put up with it and to shut up about it. And this is where the real tragedy lies. This man is still speaking. I've met more than one young bright college student who was considering joining the military but decided the culture didn't seem very open to a Hindu or a Muslim or a humanist. Thousands of the smartest young people in America avoid military service as a result of the exclusionary atmosphere created by all the little uh, Christian endorsements. Many more young officers and some troops have come to me and they are leaving the military. There's always a variety of reasons a person decides to make such a change in his life but I've often heard the phrase, it's too conservative and too Christian, written into the equation. The Air Force and our country are suffering the consequences in the form of a severe brain drain from our military because of some of these actions. Um, in 2008, in December, a presentation titled Purpose Driven Airmen which incorporated the teachings of the megachurch leader Rick Warren and creationism as a means of suicide prevention was sent by the commanders from an official government email account to 5,000 servicemen and women stationed at RAF Lackenheath, the largest Air Force base in England. In January of 2009, senior command officers again used a government email account to send an announcement at the request of a chaplain to base personnel asking them to attend a screening of a Christian movie called Fireproof. What they're pointing out here is that so many of these things are going on, kind of coming through uh, official channels, official newsletters, official websites, and the commanders are often at the base of it and they're using the official uh, communications that the military has, which of course then makes it look to these cadets as though the commanding officers of whatever base or establishment that they're at uh, approve of it and maybe have been the ones who've instigated it. And the, and the cadets feel like they're, it's almost mandatory for them to um, attend some of these events because they're made to, they're made to feel like they don't belong, that they're not doing what the commanders want if they stay in the barracks and don't attend. 
And one, uh, one commander wrote a uh, kind of a blog uh, thing in one of the military newspapers. His uh, assignment was to go to um, the base where the uh, caskets come in from Iraq and Afghanistan. And he made a comment that those that he knew were evangelical Christians, he could tell from the looks on their faces that they were, were not grieving as much as the other parents and families. And so again, coming from an officer, this was giving the impression that uh, somehow the others didn't quite measure up. One of the things I learned too is that um, during the Vietnam era is when a lot of this really began because uh, a lot of the young people who had served in the war or who were against the war just you know, began, and, and most of America towards the end of the war began to feel it had been a very unjust war. And this was kind of a, um, um, it kind of allowed or created a climate where a lot of evangelical proselyting young people wanted to join the military because they believed that the military would not get itself involved in an unjust war again if, if more of them were in the ranks. So that, that's kind of where, and that's where the chaplaincies began to increase also. By July 2007, uh, Weinstein had been co contacted by over 4,000 active duty and retired soldiers, many of whom had served in Iraq, and who told Weinstein that they were pressured by their commanding officer to convert to Christianity. And he says, uh, Weinstein says, that everyone should know that 90% of the soldiers and airmen contacting Mr. Weinstein are Christians. They just aren't dominionist or evangelicals. So they suffered as much from it as, again, the Jews, the atheists, the human, humanists, people who just simply didn't, believe, didn't need or didn't have a religion. Also, 9-1-1 was a huge, 9-11, I should say, was a huge catalyst for some of this. Um, it kind of amped up some of the inappropriate and constitutionally prohibited activities that are going on in the military. That led me to dig out some information that I had read and, and copied and kind of stored away a couple of years previously. And uh, as we all know, 9-11 gave fruit to a lot of things that our government was doing afterwards and as we went to war and then as Guantanamo was built and we began to accumulate prisoners there. And certain people in the CIA believed that the only way to obtain the needed information was to use psychological and physical torture. Enter from stage right two Mormon psychologists. These men had previously been uh, under contracts with the CIA and they'd been involved in designing and implementing and training a program that was to help our military endure torture if they were ever captured within a war. And the name of that uh, program was called SEER, Survival, Evasion, Resistance, and Escape. In 2002, they were asked to create torture techniques for the Guantanamo prisoners and others. James Elmer Mitchell and Bruce Jessen were the two psychologists. They're up from, from the Spokane, Spokane area, excuse me. Using the SEER program, they reversed the techniques and wrote the manual for the unlawful torture techniques used by the CIA and the Department of Defense at Guantanamo and at black sites in Thailand and several other secret places that to this day most Americans either don't know about and we certainly don't know where they are. Others involved were repulsed by the crude, degrading, and inhuman techniques developed by Mitchell and Jensen. Jessen. They and their associates were referred to as the Mormon Mafia. After a rash of complaints from others in the military about what was going on, Bush called for a legal opinion on the techniques. Enter from stage left, J. Bybee, another Mormon. He was at that time the Assistant Attorney General for the Office of Legal Counsel, and he was called upon to do the research and issue mem memos on the legality of the torture techniques. This work eventually became known as the Torture Memos. 
in which he okayed any and all of the torture techniques used, including waterboarding. So at that point, as far as President Bush was concerned, it was all legal. Before the torture memos were leaked, which happened eventually, Bush had already shipped Bybee out to another job. He appointed Bybee to a judgeship with the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, where he gets to continue to help shape federal law. It is a lifetime appointment, and he really can't be touched. None of them have been, as we all know. I felt it was important to interject this particular chapter to show you how soon after 9-11 there were Mormons heavily involved, and more importantly, how quickly and easily just a few people can cause a catastrophic shift in centuries-old law that all Americans had taken for granted. And I'm not trying to imply that the Mormons had you know, more to do with it than anyone else. I'm using this as an example to show you that, uh, and I'm going to be giving you more, that there are Mormons at high positions in the government who have been involved with a lot of things that most Americans, 99% of Americans don't know are going on. Most of us have heard how the CIA and the FBI actively recruit young Mormon men and women for their agencies. There are hundreds of them at work at jobs we know nothing about and many at very high levels and they can't help but have a large influence on some of the things that do go on behind secret doors and their religious beliefs have a lot to do with how they uh, uh, work at the jobs that they are given. How could the government hire any group more trained to be yes men? They are used to taking orders and deferring to authority. And I'll tell you more about the Mormons in Washington, D.C. a little bit later in this report. Uh, one of the things that makes this kind of significant is that from the very beginning there has been a uh, strong desire in the leadership of the Mormon Church to have a strong influence on the government. Remember, Joseph Smith, we saw pictures a little while ago, he created a militia and he appointed himself a general. And I remember reading that whatever rank that he appointed himself was second only to the rank that George Washington had. And so it was like at the very top of the scale. And then he uh, declared himself uh, to be running for president and sometime after that he was anointed by his closest uh, friends to be king of the world. That's, that's documented. The prophets and general authorities since him have always had a subtle agenda in regards to politics in addition to trying every way that they can get away with for ignoring the laws about separation of church and state. <clears throat> Is, this agenda is really no different than that of the Dominionists. They just aren't, uh, the works that they are doing towards this tend to be a lot more hidden than some of the things that the Dominionists are, are doing and trying to do. How many of you live in Utah? Okay. How many of you have seen the perversion of the church versus state living in the state of Utah? You probably don't even notice some of it because you are so used to it, but that's how the creep begins, one small incident at a time. It's what's happening all across America as I speak. Although in recent years there has been much more activity to confront and eliminate these offenses, it seems to work everywhere but in the military. The military continues to um, approve of and to live with a lot of these offenses that are occurring. And with the campaign this year, you know, a lot has been raised about the idea of a Mormon being uh, president and the White Horse prophecy has reared its head. The, any of you who are over 30 years of age, I'm sure, are very familiar with it. I suspect those under 30 probably haven't heard it at church, but when I was growing up, it was talked about all the time, which is that as most of us know, the prophecy that at some point the Constitution will hang by a thread and it will be the Mormon elders who will ride in and save the Constitution, save the country, and then be in charge and creating a theocracy. And that's what that 
thread has wound, I think, in the Mormon church from the very, very beginning. The Dominionists believe it will be them, and the Mormons think it will be them, and so we'll see what happens. <laughs> Uh, and Romney, as a candidate, is in a very difficult bind. The audience he's trying to reach, which is the far right wing, is vehemently opposed to the separation of church and state. They don't want a separation. They want it to be one and the same. The loudest and most powerful groups of right wing Christians want to force their own theological vision on the nation. And for Romney to assert that he'll keep religion apart from government would push this constituency away. And so he's writing a thin line, and um, he said in a speech, which I caught when he did it, and I just thought, this, this just doesn't make sense to me, <clears throat> and is not the way I believe it should be. He said, freedom requires religion, just as religion requires freedom. We are a nation under God, and in God we do indeed trust. We should acknowledge the Creator as did the Founders. He should remain on our currency, in our pledge, in the teaching of our history, and during the holiday season, religious displays should be welcome in our public places. I will not separate us from the God who gave us liberty. Let me caveat that, that I'm not talking about those who believe in God and pray to God in whatever personal way they choose, but just that what is done in violation by preaching that the two should never be separate is against our Constitution. If freedom requires religion, as Romney said, then the a-religious, the non-religious, and the unreligious are basically the enemies of freedom if you go along with this train of thought. And I want to make you, I mean, I want to assure you that I'm not bringing up Romney because of politics. I'm bringing him up because he's a representative of the kind of thinking that is going on out there by some very powerful people. When Romney met privately a few weeks ago with Tony Perkins, who's president of the Family Research Council, he sought the counsel of a leader who just days before had selected as his, as his right-hand man Lieutenant General William G. Jerry Boykin, a retired general known for his extreme contempt for Muslims. Boykin had a legendary military career as a leader of America's Special Forces. But he was rebuked by the Pentagon's Inspector General for giving speeches in uniform while dismissing the God of Islam as an idol and portraying the war on terror as a spiritual war between our God and Satan. These, are, of course, are the kinds of things that cause a 9-11 to occur. When, it, when the military starts putting it as a Christian war against Islam, we're in serious trouble. Boykin leads the religious right push to scare Americans into believing that we're under dire threat of being replaced by Sharia law. He's the one that started that whole thing. So he is the right-hand man now, second in command at Tony Perkins' organization, and it is this group that uh, Mitt Romney was meeting with and seeking support from. Uh, this Boykin character was recently invi invited to speak at the National Prayer Breakfast at West Point, and I remember when I remember reading when this happened. But a group of West Point faculty and cadets, most of them Christians, objected because of the additional threat to our deployed troops when Muslims in Iraq and in Gaf Afghanistan heard that this kind of bigot had been invited by top officers to speak at the Army Academy. And uh, he was uh, essentially, after the complaints were made, he was asked not to speak, which was you know, one step. Romney, hoping to draw the same kind of help organizing evangelical vo voters that Perkins gave to Rick Santorum, sought Perkins' input on potential running mates and on family issues. And just a couple of weeks ago uh, was the Value Voters Summit, which is held annually, sponsored by Perkins. Family Research Council and Romney and Glenn Beck were on the program, along with people such as Rick Santorum, Rand Paul, Majority Leader Eric Cantor, Michelle Bachman, etc. 
Perkins and the Family Research Council have too often been treated by mainstream media as very reasonable and responsible wings of the religious right. But by hiring this man, Boinken, they have dramatically undermined their claim to be mainstream. Just this past May, May Romney gave the commencement address at Liberty Inter University, the university founded by Jerry Falwell. These are the branches of Christianity that Mitt Romney is trying to court. This is just another example of how prominent Mormons have started partnering with the more radical evangelic dominionists for all kinds of reasons. I believe that the evangelical dominionists and the Mormons have come together more than we have any way of knowing. I think the Mormons are being used because the dominionists have no respect for Mormonism. But the Mormon leaders would never see it that way. Okay, let's talk about Glenn Beck for a minute, if you can stand to. <laughs> Quoting from an article on religion dispatches, Glenn Beck's efforts to transform himself from Fox News demagogue into a religious leader for Tea Party America has a lot of commentators discussing the feasibility of a Mormon convert leading a very wary evangelical and Catholic right in a uh, faith-driven cause. Just a few weeks ago, I was channel surfing and uh, caught um, Glenn Beck on one of the very prominent evangelical Christian TV stations, and he was doing his usual cordless mic, you know, pacing up and down the stage, ranting and being hyperactive. And <clears throat> uh, he just, I thought, well, he's I would not doubt if within the next year or two we see him leaving the Mormon Church and becoming uh, a member of this group officially. He's been kind of a church hopper all his life, from what I've read. He wouldn't be the first Mormon to advocate a right-wing alliance that stretches across other faiths. Since 1997, when Beck was just a baby Mormon, a coalition of mostly U.S.-based religious right groups called the uh, what, uh, World Congress of Families has attempted to rally religious conservatives at international pro-family conferences to transcend theological differences and to unite against common enemies. And these are the em em <laughs> enemies, excuse me. Feminism, homosexuality, liberal attitudes towards sexuality, reproductive rights, <clears throat> and the separation of church and state. That's a stated enemy, the separation of church and state. The constitutional guarantee of that is listed as an enemy for, to this group. The David M. Kennedy Center for International Studies, the J. Reuben Clark School of Law, and the School of Family Life at Brigham Young have established the World Family Policy Center to provide worldwide democratic input and effectively educate the United Nations on pro-family and other value-based issues. So they're not just working in the United States. They, they are bent on getting into the UN, which they have been able to do, to, to educate the representatives from all countries in the world. They have a tight relationship with the World Congress of Families, and Mormons have spoken <clears throat> at the World Congress of Families conventions, including Mary Ellen Smoot, who is a former General Relief Society president, and Russell Nelson, a member of the Quorum of the Twelve. Sherry Dew was a session chairman that same year, which was just last year in 2011. An important video recently made for the World Congress of Families was filmed by the BYU Audiovisual Department. More connections. We are talking about some of the farthest right-wing religionists who are working every day for an eventual theocracy around the world. Catholic, Mormon, and evangelical leaders have formed partnerships to influence UN conferences. These conferences have been transformed from the normally kind of subdued uh, conversations among the uh, non, excuse me, among the groups to stages for right-wing theater, including a Mormon youth activist who seized control of a youth caucus to deliver a right-wing statement from the world's youth. 
A chief example of this <clears throat> from the work that they're doing at the World Congress with the UN is an example called the Natural Family Manifesto, a guiding document of the World Congress of Families community co-written by Alan Carlson, who is a Lutheran, and Paul Merrill, head of the Mormon think tank here in Utah called the Sutherland Institute, a very right-wing conservative organization. The World Congress Manifesto extols a conservative lifestyle where fathers lead and women honor their highest domestic calling by becoming, quote, prolific mothers of, quote, full quivers of children. <laughs> I wonder who produced the wording. Prominent Mormons joining in the ranks of those who think the separation of church and state is what's unconstitutional. Uh, two law professors who wrote a book called Globalizing Family Values, the Christian Right in Inter International Politics, write that the manifesto secular social science rationales are part of what they call the intellectualizing of the Christian right and are mainly a contribution of Mormon lawyers and academies like Merrill's Academy. I just find that very, very interesting. In the world of dominionists, there is a network of self-proclaimed prophets and apostles who purport to be receiving direct prophecies and instructions from God about the actions that they are taking in advance of the coming of Christ. They speak in militaristic terms about waging spiritual warfare. And I think if we looked at a, a perused the talks, general conference talks of the last 20, 30, 40 years, you would often find military language, you know, army of God, we are soldiers, uh, onward Christian soldiers, this kind of thing. It has very military um, visuals that it creates. That uh, these prophets will teach that evil, they will defeat evil by taking dominion or control over all sectors of society and government, resulting in mass conversions to their brand of charismatic evangelicalism and a Christian utopia or a kingdom on earth. Rob Stein, who is a political strategist, said recently, the Christian activist right is the most powerful force in American politics today. No other political group comes even close. My take on the Mormon corporation's involvement is that they need to appear relevant somewhere. And they obviously don't have the numbers to make a dent in taking over in America and never will. They're living in some kind of la-la land of certainty that it will all devolve to the corporation at some point. The rise of evangelicalism in today's armed forces, as I said, before traces its roots to the Vietnam War and <clears throat> as public support for the war went down evangelical Christians were the only ones who remained generally supportive of the war from the beginning to the end and a lot of the stresses that went on during that time we know that was a cultural revolution in America it was the age of the hippies and free love and a lot of dope and these things that did permanently transform our society and so when we see that happening in societies it usually uh, promotes a great growth in religious uh, conversion and religious activity and that's exactly what happened but it happened mostly within the uh, pretty right-wing evangelical dominionist community. Since that time, the number of, of uh, chaplains in the military has increased by great number. And at the present time, 80% of all chaplains in all military establishments are evangelical Christians. And there's only if I remember right from my reading, between three and five percent of the people who are, you know, the, the cadets at military academies or our soldiers in, event, in Iraq and Afghanistan, only about five percent who, who claim to be evangelical Christians. And yet the chaplaincy has been increased so that it almost overtakes, um, you know, any ability for other soldiers to be able to meet with other chaplains other than an evangelical chaplain and they consider it their job is to convert is to convert the uh, the soldiers 
Okay, I gotta skip some stuff here. Let me think for a minute. The, uh, the complaints at the Air Force Academy would, would eventually, kind of cyclically, they would get a report in, they would kind of clean up their act for a while, and then it would devolve again into offenses. And that has continued to go on to this day, actually. There have been some very recent events at the Academy that show that somehow they're just not being able to, uh, I think they're not punishing or demoting or doing the things they need to do with these officers who are, doing some of these things that are so offensive to so many of the cadets. Now I'm going to turn to uh, Mormonism and another little piece of the pie. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, many, of you are pro many of you are probably aware of the uh, recent exposure about the, how the Mormon Corporation has ignored immigration regulations uh, with um, allowing illegal immigrants to go on missions. Not only are they showing no respect for the law, but they are putting these missionaries in jeopardy of being deported. The church feels that they can do whatever they want to get more baptisms. According to an estimate, 50 to 75 percent of the members of Spanish-speaking branches and wards in Utah are illegal. This includes many bishops, branch presidents, and state presidents. How is this any different than a farmer hiring people he knows are illegal? The only difference is that the church doesn't have to pay them any wages. In 2005, Mormon Senator Bob Bennett slipped a clause into an agricultural bill absolving religious groups from any criminal liability for using illegal immigrants for volunteer work which of course is all work for and in behalf of the church by these people. Therefore, the church can never suffer any uh, consequences legally because it's volunteer work, they're not paying them. That's their out. A straight line from the Senate to the Mormon church. This is, in my opinion, just another example of the lying for the Lord syndrome. But it leaves the missionaries in peril because immigration can spot them. I mean, they, they don't exactly blend into the community that they're in. You can spot them anywhere. And any time immigration sees a missionary who has darker skin, you know, they have the right to stop them. And if they're caught without papers, they are uh, taken into custody and the next job is to get them deported. So it's a, it's a big issue and the church is ignoring it. Um, a CNN reporter said the other day that with or without Romney, people don't understand that Washington DC is a surprising stronghold. Just some tidbits from a comprehensive report that was done. Uh, I'll give you some examples. Uh, Echo Hawk, it was an Indian who was the head of the U.S. Bureau of Indian Affairs, and he became a Mormon. I don't know whether it was just before or during the time that he was um, uh, asked to be the head of the uh, Bureau of Indian Affairs, but he was very prominent in D.C. He has now gone to, uh, since has left that and gone to work for the church. Um, the reporter has called it a perfect symbol of a phenomenon that could culminate if um, in Mitt Romney's arrival at the White House. The nation's capital has become a Mormon stronghold with Latter-day Saints playing a large and growing role in the Washington establishment. On a Sunday in one chapel sits a Mormon state president who came to Washington to write speeches for Ronald Reagan and now runs a lobbying firm. Behind him is a retired executive secretary of the U.S. Supreme Court. A few pews further back, the special assistant to the U.S. Special Representative for Afghanistan and Pakistan sits next to a local Mormon bishop who came to Washington to work for Senator Orrin Hatch of Utah and now leads a congressionally chartered foundation. Regardless of which, and that was just in one ward. Regardless of which party is in, Mormonism in Washington has been growing for decades. Crystal City, a Virginia neighborhood just across the Potomac River from Washington is, is known as Little Provo. 
Many Latter-day Saints joke about Washington's Mormon Mafia, referring to the number of well-placed LDS church members across town. Lewis Larson, a bishop, arrived in Washington in the early 1980s as an intern for Orrin Hatch, courtesy of Brigham Young University's inter internship program. BYU owns a four-story dorm on Pennsylvania Avenue, not too far from the White House, which houses 120 student interns each year. And if you've ever been there and seen where Pennsylvania Avenue you know, is, you can imagine the cost of real estate anywhere close to the White House. The church oh, is the church's largest such program in the nation, and the church also maintains a very large and very active employment office in the heart of D.C. So, Larson says, we are on our missions converting people to Christianity and coming to Washington. For me and probably for a lot of people, we came out of that interest. This is a Mormon talking. We see it as our career, but also we're going out to preach the word of Christ. Hmm, does that sound familiar? Very much the same as what I've been telling you about the far-right evangelical and dominious movements. Much of Washington's Mormon professional network is still anchored by BYU's alumni groups, and the most prominent one is the BYU Management Society, which is a global organization. At the chapter's recent alumni dinner, former Secretary of State Condoleezza Rice was the guest of honor. She has strong ties to the Mormon community and has hired Mormons as top aides. Says Larson, Condi's got a ton of Mormon contacts, and these are my words, and Condi is still a very powerful person in the Republican Party who can pull in favors. Then it goes on to talk about how many people get into the foreign surface because of the language uh, skills that Mormons uh, have coming home from their missions. And, and this little tidbit, uh, an interesting note is that the Washington, D.C. temple houses a J. Willard Marriott fi financed mural of Jesus Christ's second coming, which feature, features a picture of the Washington temple in the background. Think about that for a moment. He, a temple visitor asked him, are you implying that the millennium will begin at Washington? Replied Marriott, what better place is there? My question is, what happened to Independence, Missouri? I thought it was very interesting. How many of you, I'm sure, have heard of the Moonies, the cult of Moonies, and and uh, they came to this country in order to convince, you know, to convert the world, starting with the U.S. It's a Korean church uh, into their brand of Christianity, and very much pushed the idea of a, a worldwide theocracy. The only reason I'm bringing them up is because of this incident that happened. This was several years ago. The most bizarre event in the Mooney saga was the March two, uh, 2004 ceremony right inside the Dirksen Senate office building in Washington, D.C. U.S. Representative Dan Davis, wearing white gloves, carried a pillow. Oh, you got him up there. Okay. Don't have ice back here. Um, carried a pillow holding the anort an ornate crown to Moon, who reached out, snatched up the crown, and made himself king of the world. <laughs> Several senators and representatives also attended, and I'm guessing their campaign coffers received some very healthy checks. And this article is by, that I'm going to quote next, is by a man by the name of Derek Shore, who is a Mormon, and this was in the Huffington Post. He said, for the first time in American history, a Mormon is the presidential nominee for a major political party. The Romney campaign has swiftly dismissed questions about his religion as inappropriate and irrelevant. And it may seem that much of the media has tiptoed around this topic and have discussed the LDS Church in glossy, broad terms. But here's why Mr. Romney's religion is relevant. For Mormons, there really is no such thing as separation of church and state. And he goes on to explain how 
within the doctrine of Mormonism is the thread, as we've discussed earlier, that um, eventually the Mormons will be in charge here in America, and it's from the theocracy in America that it will then spread to the whole world until the whole world is underneath the uh, priesthood guidance of Jesus Christ and the Mormon elders. I'm going to give you just a few more examples of what's going on in the military <clears throat> and then uh, and give you a few things at the end about Mormonism, again, that are interesting. Um, in September of 206, 2006, Mickey Weinstein has been fighting this battle all these years, and he asked that the New Mexico's Air Force Base and the 523rd Fighter Squadron's use of Crusaders as the unit's nickname and the squadron's emblem, which features a cross, a sword, and an armored helmet. Now, he said, you know, our planes should not be flying over Afghanistan and Iraq with a cross painted on the back of it. You know, I mean, a little titillating, I would think. Well, he won his argument, and they eventually painted them all out. And I've read just within the last two or three weeks. Uh, it didn't happen just within the last two or three weeks, but I found out that they battled it. And once again, the planes are flying over Iran and Afghanistan, who knows where else, with a Christian cross on the back of them. Uh, I don't know. I, I can't imagine how the military can justify this. Now. This is something that just killed me, and I saw this video, uh, because, and so I know it, I know it happened. Uh, first of all, by, by 2000, or t yeah, 2009, more than two million Bibles in Arabic language had been sent to Afghanistan and to Iraq for our soldiers to disperse among the people in those countries. And the argument that he got about this thing, about having the name of Crusaders, the military said to him, you know, well, the Crusaders had nothing to do with religion. <laughs> you know, I mean, showing you how uneducated they are. Uh, and he proceeded, of course, to educate them differently. But, you know, it just blew his mind that, that they were so ignorant of how offensive this would be to Islamic people. Now, somebody, uh, an army officer was filmed um, in, his name was Colonel Gary Hensley, and he was an a officer and a chaplain for the 101st Airborne, and the chief army chaplain for all of Afghanistan. So he was the top chaplain for, the whole, for all the soldiers in Afghanistan. And he was filmed in a service in Bagram's main chapel, surrounded by Bibles that had been translated into Pashtu and Dar, and which were regularly given to the soldiers. And this is what he said. He was telling the soldiers that as followers of Jesus Christ, they all have a responsibility to go out there and hunt people for Jesus. Be witnesses for him. The special forces guys, they hunt men, basically. We do the same thing as Christians. We hunt people for Jesus. We do. We hunt them down and get the hounds of hell after them. That's our business. And I've seen the video. I know it happened. The military also allowed two civilian missionaries to be embedded with U.S. troops in Afghanistan so that they could evangelize the Afghans. Not our soldiers, but the Afghans. That's why they were there. Evangelical groups have explicitly targeted the deployed in the U.S. military because they are very vulnerable. You know, they are suffering a lot of psychological damage, a lot of physical damage. They're looking for a way out, and uh, for a lot of them, religion uh, is very comforting to them. And so, and I'm not, I'm not questioning that. I, I think it's, you know, it's something a lot of people need, and in, particularly during that time. But for the government to allow only evangelical missionaries to be embedded with the troops is where the unconstitutional comes in, and they get away with it. 
The military ministry of the uh, Campus Crusade for Christ is located everywhere in the military at every single establishment and in every academy and every basic training center. And their goal is to evangelize and disciple all the enlisted men, uh, members of the U.S. military. How many of you heard of, have heard of the National Prayer Breakfast? They go on every year. They are Christian oriented and they are actually, which I didn't realize, they've been going on since the early 50s. And they are uh, organized by the group called The Family, which is the group I mentioned at the very beginning uh, that Jeff Charlotte researched and he actually embedded himself with them for a few months and that's how he found out so much about them. But I, I just I had figured that Congress or somebody had arranged these prayer breakfasts, which in the, you know, I thought was wrong too, but they are definitely organized. And they have had a great deal of influence in lobbying um, congressmen. And, you know, and our presidents all attend these prayer breakfasts and they are definitely just Christian oriented. Why they feel that they have to attend these um, is beyond me. And I've always felt, even from when I was in high school and I first heard about them, that it was unconstitutional, but it's been going on now for about 60 years. The military ministry that I've just expressed to you uh, has a website <clears throat> the states that they have successfully converted thousands of soldiers to evangelical Christianity. And in the Bible classes that it teach, the classes are called Crew, short for Crusade. In a video, a ministry uh, person said, our purpose for Campus Crusade for Christ at the Air Force Academy in particular is to make Jesus Christ the issue at the Air Force Academy and around the world. They're government paid missionaries when they leave here. And every time I look at that statement, I get st stunned. I, I don't understand how this is being allowed to continue within our military academies. And the officers, some of the officers uh, produced another video at one point and when they were chastised for it, what they said is, we thought it was okay because the Christian embassy has become a quasi-federal entity since the Department of Defense had endorsed the organization to general officers for 25 years. So we're talking about the Department of Defense from the very highest endorsing a, the, something called the Christian embassy uh, to be infiltrated within the, the people in the military. They've been putting on concerts, religious uh, Christian concerts that have been co that the Department of Defense is paying for. And I had an example here. I'm just not going to take time to tell you all about it. But this particular con they always have Christian rock groups there. And what happens is is that if you don't attend the concerts, these are at some of the bases you are on lockdown in, in your barracks. And they put you into maintenance duty, which is cleaning, and these kinds of things are not allowed to leave their barracks until the concert's over if they refuse to attend. And I'm not, you know, this is not made up. I've, I've, there are thousands of soldiers and military people who have gone to Mickey Weinstein and told him about these events. So the, the last, the one that I was going to tell you about, they figure, from, they, they did get paperwork on it, but there were some expenses that weren't listed. But the cost of this particular concert by the Department of Defense was $100,000 to put it on. And our tax money is paying for that and a lot of other things. Now, I'm, gonna, I'm going to kind of finish with, um, Oh, I know it. I put the next slide up, would you? Of the, yeah, that's the right one. Very quickly, I'll tell you, they discovered, and some of you may have written, read this, for many, many years, the company that's been making a lot of the rifles that our soldiers in, in Iraq and Afghanistan are using have Christian scriptures embossed on them. At a point where when they're citing the rifle, the scripture is right here. That's one of the scriptures up there. And... Uh, 
people just went berserk when they heard this. It's been going on for years, and so it's not happening anymore. But the Iraqis and Afghanistans, it made them able to say that they were being shot at by Christian rifles. You know, it's just this kind of subtle stuff, as we know, uh, the, the ones who are most extreme in those groups, that's all they need, you know, to start planning some nefarious thing against our troops. Uh, next slide. Then they started dispersing a certain Bible um, that the evangelical Protestant groups use, and they were putting the insignias of all the different military groups on them. And a lot of people, this is just one of them, the Marines, uh, a lot of people complained about it. Thousands of these Bibles went out to people in the Navy, Marines, Air Force, Army. And that has now been stopped also. But it was just another sign of the blending, you know, kind of a visual sign of the blending of the military with, with religion. Now, one of the things I found out, um, and this has been fairly recent, is that they have a new, they started a new training for the, the officers who were dealing with nuclear weapons. And the training was called the Mandatory Nuclear Ethics and Nuclear Warfare Session, which included a discussion of Christian just war theory. And it's led by chaplains, and it takes place during a missile officer's first week in training at Vandenberg Air Force Base in California. Air Force documents just released under a FOA request indicated that more than 30 Air Force officers, a majority of whom describe themselves as practicing Protestants and Roman Catholics, did contact Mickey Weinstein's organization to tell them what was going on in this Christian theme training for these officers. One of the slides quotes Werner von Braun, a former member of the Nazi party and SS officer. He is regarded uh, as the father of our space program, and I, and I did know this. I knew that he was involved, and I knew that he was a Nazi. He was being cited in this training, not as a scientific expert, rather He's specifically being referenced as a moral authority, which is remarkable considering that the Nazi scientists used Jews imprisoned in concentration camps and captured French anti-Nazi partisans and civilians to help build the V2 rocket. Now this is what killed me. Von Braun said upon surrendering to American forces in May of 1945, we wanted to see the world spared another conflict such as Germany had just been through. And we, quote, felt that only by surrendering such a weapon to people who are guided by the Bible could such an assurance to the world be best secured. Evidently, he hadn't spent much time studying world history because everyone goes to war. Eventually, they were able to get all this kind of stuff out of this training. But this is what the missile officers were taking with them as they went to only th one of three places in America where they would be stationed, where they have, are trained to release the nuclear missiles if it should ever come to that. Back to Congress as I, as I close here. Uh, <clears throat> the religiously co-opted Congress is equally as dangerous and potentially damaging, such as Utah's very own Senator Mike Lee. In an interview on MSNBC last July, during the budget crisis, Senator Mike Lee admitted that he is using the threat of a catastrophic default to extort the nation into rewriting the Constitution to force a permanent era of conservative governance. That's why he was holding up the budget. Regardless of who is elected, they have to perform their governmental duties uh, as a conservative person. And he had a simple plan to force his colleagues in Congress to make this happen. He might be Mormon, but he sounds just like the other fanatics that have been mentioned. We saw a lot of them in the, in the Republican primary. And there are dozens of others in Congress, a lot of them were elected in the, in the 2010 election, 
and in different uh, other positions with that within the country. I could have taken a half hour to tell you also what's been going on in our schools across America. And uh, just make yourself aware, there's a, a huge movement to take government, uh, take the public schools out of being public schools all across America and making them all private. And I am not a conspiracy theorist and I'm, I don't consider myself a fanatic about any of this stuff, but it is happening. I've seen enough that you as parents and citizens need to really be aware of what's going on in your local school. Religious freedom in America has always meant freedom from state involvement in religion. And it has always been understood, at least until now, that this freedom requires that the state refrain from granting any privilege to religion. The whole point of the First Amendment with its carefully balanced clauses prohibiting the establishment of religion while guaranteeing the right to free exercise religion is to make sure that freedom of religion comes with this necessary freedom from religion. And I have a hard time with some of my Mormon relatives who think that I'm talking about doing away with our religion. That's not what we're talking about. It's the freedom to live your religion as you choose to live it. And I admonish to you as a group because we've been through so much in our lives because of religious things that we learned, uh, religion that we were born into, a lot of us. Be willing to work against these situations that are local to you and press for a lawful resolution when these offenses occur. All the while supporting the idea that everyone can worship how they may as long as they do not insist that someone believe as they do and then acquire the power to make that happen. Knowledge is power, and one of the Dominionist's most successful tools over the years has been staying under the radar. That is changing. They are getting bolder, and the exposure of their true goal must receive more attention from all of us. Those of you who live in Utah probably live in the most fertile place in the country to find examples of this infringement. You also have a very powerful and very wealthy organization here who does most of the offending. And it usually gets its way. You should take every opportunity to point it out when you see it, because it really is time for that to be stopped. Not only here, but in every military academy, every military camp and fort, every place our troops are deployed, in every school and every state and federal congress. Those of us have made, those of us here have made great sacrifices to live free of everything I've described in this presentation. And I personally feel a great responsibility to do my part to expose anything that infringes on our rights to live and think without fear. Thank you.